out here tonight. My name is Erica. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the events associate here at Books or Magic. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go over some housekeeping points for tonight. First off, we do kindly ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. Towards the end of the event, we will be doing an audience hand-raised Q&A. So please start thinking of some questions to ask now and raise your hand when the time comes. After the talk tonight, Marcy will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near the side door where you can exit. We also have additional books to purchase from my colleague Christina, whom you met at our side entrance. If you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we highly encourage you to buy a copy of Hurricane Girl online using the link in the live stream description. All right, so tonight it is my privilege to introduce Marcy Dermansky and Megan Abbott, who are here to discuss Marcy's book, Hurricane Girl. This offbeat tale of 32-year-old Allison Brody dares to walk the line of visceral horror and laugh out loud humor. Dermansky manages to write the sort of beach read you might not have expected to enjoy, full of twists and compelling interrogations of love, millennial life, and violence. I'm inclined to share with you all a bit of this New York Times book review. Dermansky's offbeat humor and spare prose make Allison's mind a thrilling and wholly unusual place to be, a wickedly entertaining read from first to last. Marcy Dermansky is the author of the critically acclaimed novels Very Nice, The Red Car, Bad Marie, and Twins. She has received fellowships from the McDowell Col Colony and the Edward F. Albee Foundation. Megan Abbott is the award-winning author of 10 novels, including The Turnout, You Will Know Me, The Fever, and Dare Me. She is the co-creator and executive producer of USA's adaptation of Dare Me and was a staff writer on HBO's David Sh Simon's show, The Deuce. And please join me now. <laughs> we have Megan <laughs> Abbott and Marcy Dermansky. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, would you like to start us off with a reading? Yeah, I do. Let's calibrate this. Does this sound good, everybody? Yeah. Okay. I was going to start like a little bit further ahead in the book, but you know what? I think I'm just going to start in the beginning because that makes the most sense. <laughs> I think so. Great. Allison Brody bought a beach house. She was 32 years old, sick of everybody and everything. <laughs> All she wanted to do, more than anything really, was swim. The beach house was small. It was in North Carolina in foreclosure. She put cash down, emptying her accounts, everything that she had. She used money saved from waitressing, money saved from a small inheritance after her father died almost a year ago. She had sold a script too and made some okay money from that. A solid chunk. It was a horror script. It was not necessarily make a good movie, but a famous actress had agreed to star in it. And so there could be more scripts, more money, success. Alice had been seen as a movie producer's pretty younger girlfriend. She could have been known in her own right. Probably it had been stupid to leave Los Angeles just when her career had started taking off. And there were so many places to swim. The movie producer, for instance, had a beautiful swimming pool. Maybe, maybe leaving had been stupid. Maybe Allison wanted to create art one day after she swam. Maybe one day she would want to have a cat. The movie producer was allergic to cats. <laughs> Maybe she actually wanted to be alone, and certainly not with the man who had hit her. It had happened only a few times, exactly three, but it also seemed possible that it could happen again, even though the movie producer had promised that it wouldn't. She drove cross country, doing the speed limit, buying coffee from Starbucks along the way, and the beach house turned out to be perfect. Two small bedrooms and a bathroom on the second floor with a view of the ocean. A front porch where Allison could drink her coffee and breathe in the ocean air. Almost all Allison knew about North Carolina was from a long ago vacation, and it had been wonderful, her favorite childhood memory. The road trip had been insanely long, a caravan with another family. They had taken regimented bathroom stops. When she woke, she had been delivered to a house with an oval swimming pool and a view of the ocean. Allison remembered a large pink dolphin float in the pool with a cup holder built in it for drinks. All the parents got drunk every night, and everyone laughed a lot, and the kids were allowed to do whatever they wanted. That's the beginning. <laughs> um, so, first of all, I love this book so much. I love all your books, but this is my favorite yet. Um, I, I can't I, hear to say that. It's, <laughs> I know, it's so true. I could not, I, I, I mean, some, and one of the reviews talked about how hard it was to, to finish this in one reading, and it was so hard. I actually was getting my hair colored while I was reading really? it, and I'm like, hold it, hold it, I want to go 10 more minutes. Um, 
questions. Can you tell us a little bit about Allison to set the stage? Uh, because we definitely get a little, I mean, that, that first chapter is so sort of perfect because it doesn't indicate anything about what's to come. Oh, right. I mean, it's sort of this plan that she has and then nothing in the plan works out <laughs> uh, without giving anything away. So, so we start with Allison's plan, but what, how, what was your plan for Allison when you start? How do you find her? I mean, I really did start just with the idea of having a beach house, which is something I would love to have. I don't think I'm ever honestly going to have a beach house. I mean, because they're just prohibitively expensive and they do get destroyed by hurricanes. They really, <laughs> really do. And so I think that was just my idea. That was the whole start of this book was giving somebody a beach house and taking it away. And so that's the first scene, which is only two pages, and she loses her beach house in the next scene, essentially. And that's just what I wanted to do. And I didn't really know who she was, and I didn't know how old she was going to be, or anything about her. And so all the little details about the money from her inheritance or waitressing, all of it came later. Like, I kind of layered it back in when I figured out who she was. Okay, that's so interesting, yeah. because one of the first things we learn about her is that she wrote this screenplay, yeah. and I, I read this interview, and I, I think about this so much, too, one of the hardest things when you're a writer is what do your characters do for a living? Yeah. I mean, it's embarrassing <laughs> how much time it takes, because right. we have so little understanding about okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's embarrassing. It's totally so, embarrassing. So, um, you write about dancers. Yeah, yes. I mean, actually, I, go, I really lean into stuff I yeah. don't understand, but... You often write about writers or something like that. Yeah. It's so, embarrassing. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but, but what made you land on screenwriting? So screenwriting is because it's so different to be a screenwriter <laughs> than to be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, really, that's really it. I just didn't want her to be a writer, but of course she's a writer. The only thing that, that really changed thing is that because she was a horror writer, then that was a detail that I had to go back to. And so I ended up almost by accident writing a horror novel. Yes. And I think if she hadn't been a screenwriter of a horror book, that wouldn't have happened. But I knew that part, so then it worked for me. That makes so much sense. Because yeah. it is, I mean, it sort of sounds, it's slightly misleading to say it's a horror novel, but yeah. it is a horror. I mean, right. there's just some shocking things that happen in it. And it's very yeah. suspenseful, yeah. because we so worry for Allison. Yeah. And, and it's just so interesting that that would be the thing she was writing. But that kind of just fell off when you started and then it sort of ruled. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so everything in that first chapter just became... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That so, all probably kind of got added. Like, and I then think, you layer it back yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then why start where you started? You said it a little, but one would think maybe one would ramp up to... to the hurricane or <laughs> or that we would have some of her life in LA. I think it's so interesting to start at the moment of decision. Yeah. You know, is that did that create a sense of urgency for you or or was it having the godlike power to take it? It must be the godlike power. Like I always want to take credit. Like this is what I did for urgency, but that's just really the idea that I started with. Whenever I start a book I don't really know what I'm gonna do or if it's gonna click. I start lots of books and I'm just abandoned them after page 10 or so and this one this one I felt clicked and that's when I had to go back and kind of add you more to the out beginning. Who she yeah was. yeah but I think that's always what people talk about with writing I think it was Antonio Nelson once said like where you start your book is like the most important thing and you, it's the thing you think the, little, the least about yeah it really is. is I mean I feel like it's not I feel like we take credit for everything we do but it, I, it also feels like luck but it's yes. not luck because we did it on purpose <laughs> <laughs> it's kind yeah. of luck yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly um one of the things, and I'm really avoiding spoilers because I was telling Marcy how shocked I was by some of the turns in it, but mm. I think I can say this in, without spoiling anything because we've already mentioned a hurricane. This is that this to me this is a book in large part about the way trauma works, but not in a way anybody talks about mm. because it's sort of there's all these cliches about uh, trauma porn and we're saving everything about, but, but this seems to me about how it feel, the unex the way it can come back and like swing back on you yeah. and come up at unexpected times and um, and sort of make you behave in ways you can't explain and it feels like that's a lot of the book and it makes it so moving but is that something you thought about too or did that come in as you I think that came in <laughs> I mean, it was always just something to fall back in whenever she didn't know what to do. It was like, oh, she would, like, remember. Like, oh, yeah, I was smashed yeah. over the head at one point. And so, yeah, yeah. that was a spoiler. Right. Yeah. Well, and, mm -hmm. and she, it's, not always, it's not always that she's upset even by mm -hmm. it. It yeah. can take odd forms. Yeah. Like, in some ways, her trauma 
brings her back to elementals, like food and sex and coffee. Yeah, turkey sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and swimming. Yeah. And swimming, yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to ask you more about that. Okay. <laughs> but um, does that also, because we, we enter in the state of emergency for her, um, sort of take you away from the demands of regular life for your character? In other words, she's sort of, she's sort of, um, in some ways, on the, she's not on the run because she's not, but she kind of is on the run, mm -hmm. <laughs> metaphorically, but does that sort of, um, so that you don't have to have her going to her job or right. taking care of things? I w wonder a little bit, you can talk about that, about what that gave you. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I never know what, what's going to be autobiographical or what's not, but I feel like at a certain point in my life, I sort of stepped out of what other people do. <laughs> Like, I, I mean, I work from home, and I did that before the pandemic, and I did that through the pandemic, and so I think that changes, yeah. So you already feel a certain freedom from some responsibilities, and so for your characters, it's an easier place? Maybe, or? yeah. Yeah, maybe it's really indulgent. Yeah. Well, no, but maybe it's also, I don't know, I think about this, because women don't usually get to play those characters in books. It's sort of a classic trope of the male on the road or the male going out and having adventures oh, yeah. and Jack Kerouac and all that. It's very rare because women are supposed to be chained by these different responsibilities and obligations. But your books, it's always reversed. It seems. Like. I guess so. I mean, I, it's been pointed out to me. It was pointed like it was pointed out. I always I go back. I've said this before, but Emily St. John Mandel once said to me, "Aren't." When, do you, when are you going to write about men? And I was like, oh, wait, don't I? And I, just, I didn't know that I hadn't. So my next book, and very nice, I, I wrote about, I had two male point of views. But but mainly, mainly I'd rather write about women. And so, or yeah. at least from their point, point of view, because you have, I mean, you have some really interesting men in this book. Do you oh, want to talk that. about, if, in, at least in general terms? Of that? Well, I feel bad whenever I meet somebody now named Keith. And I have met Keith <laughs> named Keith. And so that Keith, if you're named Keith, you're not going to like this book. Well, we heard that the director, Billy Wilder, whenever he didn't like a character, he named him Sheldrake. So oh, in really? all his movies, there's a villain named Sheldrake. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that sounds evil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's some innocuous Keiths out there, I'm not sure. And then, and then it's interesting, because there's, there's a doctor, there's an old boyfriend that comes back and becomes a new boyfriend. And strangely enough, one of my early readers, like, didn't like him and thought that he wasn't good enough for Allison. And I was like, but Danny's so nice. Like I was totally, so nice. I was so happy with her. Like I didn't think she was settling and I was like, and he has a swimming pool. So it was interesting. It was interesting to me that. It is yeah. the main currency in this book and several of your books. Yeah. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah. it's, um, but he, I mean, when he appears in the book, this is sort of one of the marvels about your writing to me, is it feels like you just decide, oh, I think she knows this guy. And then, like, I know that can't really be true, but it does have this sort of quality, like, that, that there's this doctor who Maybe. she knows from before. I loved, I mean, writing that scene, I didn't know that I was going to make it that boyfriend until I did. Oh. So that's just so fun about discovering, like, that's what I like to write about. And then once you know that I'm making it her old boyfriend, then it sort of changes the whole story. But I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know he was going to be Asian. I didn't, you know, and I had to keep tweaking it until it, it felt right. So, yeah. Right. And, it, yeah. and then that makes sense, too, because in some ways, because Allison has had some injuries, let's just say. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, um, she kind of, you feel a little bit like she's operating from not quite, Yes, yeah. that noble state too. Right. So she's super every, vulnerable. Yeah, right? yeah, then you want to take care of. I mean, I was so worried about her through mm -hmm. through the whole book. Really, um, it felt like at any minute she could kind of break. And yeah. and the relationship, Danny is a very stable person. Yeah. So you're sort of glad for him. Um, was it hard keeping her in that kind of pitch? I guess. Um, no, that, that, that actually wasn't hard. I mean, maybe because this book is short. Like, maybe if it were longer, like, that sense of urgency wouldn't really carry through. But that that wasn't hard. And, I mean, honestly, like, one person asked me about, like, my version of feminism af after reading this book. Because, yeah. like, if I were to... One of, one of Danny's, not even just that Danny has a swimming pool, but Danny is a doctor. Like, you know, there's a joke from one of her divorced friends who, like, has no money and lives with her parents. It's like, you got your rich doctor. <laughs> and, I, and I think growing up, like, the last thing I would have wanted to have was a rich doctor. I think, you know what I mean? There's something romantic about being poor and not caring. But, like, if I could go back again and marry for the first time, I think, why not marry somebody who has some money? It's just as easy to yeah. marry a doctor. <laughs> right? And so, so I got to do that for her.
Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, I think the sort of trickiness of the, to look at sort of the feminism of your book, I do think it's so much about how female freedom, these, these stories of female freedom, mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that somehow it feels like you're not allowed to have, there's moments when she really wants to be taken care of and there's a lot of passivity to Allison. Yeah. And it's sort of tricky, you know, it's not always fully passive, but mm -hmm. she, and it feels like somehow you're not supposed to do that, but I love how you do that, because of course people do. Right. But sometimes you do want to be taken care of, and sometimes you do want to indulge in fantasies, and Allison seems to be in a free space to do all yeah. that. So there's a little bit of wish fulfillment? Maybe. I I'm mean, getting me to psychoanalyze. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like a single mother. I would love to be taken care of. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So, yeah. And yeah. It seems, so, it's not necessary. No, right. It seems like she's actually punished for having a plan at the beginning. Oh, of the yeah. So, she learned. Yeah. So, she, she really learns how to, like, it's better not to have a plan. And it's better to have other people have their plan. Yeah. And, uh, and she's sort of going backwards to adolescence or even childhood because at a certain point she's with her family. Yeah. Or, or they her always mom. make you revert back. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that her her it's a lot about it's a lot about um, food and comfort for her. Yeah. Were you writing this during the pandemic? The funny thing is is mainly I wasn't. Like okay. mainly I wrote almost all of this before the pandemic and I kind of wrote literally just like the last two scenes. Um, during the pandemic, wow. which is maybe why they're kind of as, as harsh as they are. So, yes. yeah, but it was good that I had, like, a book written yes. before the pandemic that I got to finish. It's fine to finish it, and it was fine to edit it, but I, I wrote almost nothing during the pandemic, so, because um, my daughter, like, was at home for school, and I couldn't concentrate. I blame it all on her. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been a way that I could have, but I, but I didn't, so, yeah. It's because it is sort of, I guess we're all trying to read into books coming out after the pandemic, right. what that role that played, and this sort of food and comfort yeah. and desire for safety in a in an unsafe world. I mean, not that right. the world wasn't unsafe before the pandemic, yeah. but it feels maybe it feels even pit more heightened that's after it. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, did you know where her path, Allison's path would take her? No, oh, no, wow. I didn't. Yeah, I had no idea. So. And so that was kind of exciting to write because I never knew what she was going to do. And sometimes I'd be like, wow, I'm going to do that. It's fun. Right? That was really good. Because sometimes yeah. she seems to be doing great, and you think, this is going to be it. She's yeah. going to settle on this, right. she never does. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it goes back again to one of the things I think is so interesting about, I think about, I mean, this is sort of going to be a very odd parallel, but I think about Joan Didion a lot when yeah. I read your books, cause, because That's in some ways, she, her books are very serious, yeah. and yours have so much humor in them. Right. But... I think they're really like Joan Didion in that there are, well, first of all, they're about women in, on the freeway all the time, <laughs> and just swimming pools, yeah. so there's that too. But also, it's really about uh, a female experience that rejects sort of typical female experiences right. for something a little more anarchic and, and uh, riskier. I mean, that's just so exciting, because that's the first time I've ever been compared to Joan Didion, so you just, like, made my everything. Oh, good. Do you like Joan Didion? Yeah, she's okay. amazing. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it feels, yeah, that it feels to me, even both in Didion's novels and in her essays, there is also the darkness, the dark thread in that, which is a part of this book. Did you ever feel that that might take over, or did you feel sort of in control of it? Um. Yes, <laughs> we're worried about it. I guess. There, yeah. there was a part where, where I think I was worried about okay. what was going to have to happen, yeah. and there's kind of a small revenge storyline. Yes, and, and I didn't, I didn't want to go there. I literally didn't, and I didn't for a while. So the great thing about reading a book is that you don't read the draft that came before it. And the draft that came before it, there was about, like, I think I cut almost 100 pages, and I don't think even you got to read Jenny. You didn't. She literally just has this friend in this book called Lori, who's not a great friend, and they just hang out, and they go out for turkey sandwiches, and they go swimming, and when the pool closes, they go swimming at a gym with the pool on the roof, and nothing happens. <laughs> and then the book ends. <laughs> so, so that all got deleted really quickly. So I just, I didn't want to go there. But once I did, then it, then it all just happened. I mean, really I guess easily. you could say that that's the darker ending, though, yeah. just turkey sandwiches with yeah. infrequent friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not but, such a good line. But, yeah, because yeah. there is that feeling 
of spaces that you keep knocking us out of where we're kind of, Allison seems to be in one place for a while, maybe a good place, at least a better place, but you never stay there right. for long. Yeah. Was it when you decided you wanted to leave or uh, just instinctual for you? Well, I mean, the, the, the pool closing really had to change the plot, because if you're going to stay with a man because he has a swimming pool, and then the pool closing... <laughs> but you did choose to make the pool close. <laughs> well, but don't they just do the pool? I mean, yeah, outdoor pools true. close, yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard thing just in my life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have swimming pools in all of your books? No, I don't think so. I mean, at least three. Very nice, this yes. book. But you have a swimming pool in Red Car, don't you? Maybe it's just that. No, the, the neighbors have one, as That's you can right. see. It up I knew, yes, yes, yes. But it's, it's they, they've grown, and so what, what I'm hoping to write maybe is the next book is to not have swimming pools and not have writers. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know. I feel like it's a very powerful symbol. Is it okay? For you. I, I, I can, yeah. Uh, maybe it's okay. I don't know. I feel like I mean, yeah. what is I I read that you were a lifeguard. I was a lifeguard. So yeah, yeah. that was a great job. So yeah, yeah, that you read Tender as the Night while you were. In the lifeguard chair, yeah. that's Scott Fitzgerald novel, that's a good which one. I thought was sort of kind of perfect. But is does your early your early adolescent lifeguard experience connect to the swimming pools, or did you seek that job because you already had a um, liked swimming pools? You know, that job actually wasn't even about, I don't think I even used to, I used to be the kid who like saw growing up swimming laps and thought they're the most boring people okay. ever and why don't they have fun. I just literally had friends who were all lifeguards and they were like, this is our summer job and it's amazing. So I took a class just to have a job. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, swimming really developed for me like in college. Okay. Like I started swimming laps in an indoor pool and then it sort of grew as I, as I ate, as I got it. Do you, I mean, it strikes me that swimming pool works differently than in very nights nice here. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, more casual, I mean, yeah. Yes, right, and yeah. more about um, um, a luxury object, yeah. I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. um, so maybe, yeah. I mean, I think the other thing to say, I think the swimming pools were more about sw more, more than swimming pools in your book. I and think here, so. for it's Allison, it seems to be. It's sort of a freedom and escape, just going underwater. Yeah, and so that's much more prevalent, I think, in this book. Than, and the. Um, yeah. And if you, they, yeah, it seems like there's a therapeutic quality. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because yeah. there is also a lot of sense. She's also thinking about her childhood a lot. Yeah. And was that something that? Um, how much did you want to reveal about her childhood? Well, I mean, to me, in a way, one thing in reviews and things that that isn't really talked about at all, which is good for my comfort level, is, is the middle of the book doesn't get discussed, like her relationship with her mother, yeah. and she. When and she has brother. a brain injury and her brother, and she goes to a hospital where she meets a doctor. And I mean, that hospital literally is the hospital where my father went to spend oh, his final wow. days. Yeah, it's all autobiographical, so yeah. now you all know. But people tend not to notice that, so that's great. But I didn't know that I was going to write about that. You know? Yeah. Like, I didn't even, like, when on Facebook now, it's this strange place that when somebody you love dies, somebody makes a post about it. Yeah. I didn't make a post. So this, this was my Facebook post about my <laughs> Yeah. A little bit more than that, but yeah. It, it feels like, um, in some ways, though nothing bad happens to her in the hospital, it feels yeah. like she's a place she can't wait to get out of, sure. uh, which feels right. And right. the swimming pool is sort of the opposite yeah. of that for her. Yeah. That, that feels right. Um, in terms of the darker qualities, did you ever envision a version where it would go more, more? <laughs> Because as so we'll see, we're promoting talking about something that happens in the first twenty-five pages, but okay. it's so shocking that I didn't, <laughs> want, I didn't want to talk about it. In okay. case you, those of you who haven't read it yet, which I'm sure it's most of you, um, but it feels like it could have been a thriller, like a straight thriller straight at that You're point. A thriller, right? Yeah. So yeah. to me, I I, yeah. um, um, I thought about that so much because it, it it feels like a classic woman in. In jeopardy yeah. moment and and I think you use it so beautifully and so complicatedly but I wondered if that was ever um, you envisioned it going down a more thriller route um, I think I avoided it but yeah. then when we go back to the end it does go yeah. there and I reread this book about like two or three months ago because I had forgotten and I'm at this point I'm reading this I'm like don't do that like I felt that reading I'm like don't do that don't do that. and so it was interesting so I think I took it there but it yeah. took me a little extra right. to page right yeah. She made some really dumb choices, 
Yeah. <laughs> she could have really got into a lot more trouble than she did. But I feel like she's very in in the mo she's very much a survivor too, really. Yeah. Like okay. she's always I mean, one of the things it's like the, certain things happen to her because she's really needs a new charger for her phone and that like we all can identify with that, yeah. right? Where's my charger? I don't have my charger. And she had one all along. She did. <laughs> you know, sometimes a charger's not just a charger. Yeah. But there's some that um, I think one of the intoxications of reading a book like this, it is in some ways a road story from sorts. Um, yeah. And and it's sort of an es uh, escape there for someone who's been sort of unhooked from the stream of their life is that you can go with them and they're really thinking about is there a motel here? Where will I stay? Will I get wa go to the drugstore and get water for my like? There's something that's sort of so compulsive about that because yeah. we imagine ourselves in that situation. Right. So is that something you did when you put her in these situations? Oh, like sure. How do you yeah. how do I get her out of this? Right. I mean, I think that one of the reasons why she didn't get a cell phone charger is literally because the CVS was on the other side of a double lane road. <laughs> and I, I just like driving sometimes just makes me feel insane. And if the, the store is on the other side of the road like I will almost come close to running out of gas if I don't want to make a difficult turn so a lot of my weird stuff I just gave to her yeah, yeah. I, think, I, mean, I guess that's the part that makes it weirdly it, all of it so identifiable yeah. even though these extreme things happen to her yeah. which is like two things happen to her that rarely happen to one person much less the same person you know yeah. um so is that is that she, that it is very grounded in these details that yeah. we can all walk right. into yeah it feels true um, were there writers that you thought about when you were writing it, or do you think about other write like other books you like, or you, uh, or is it just does it come from another place? It just comes from another place, I think, when I'm writing. Yeah, I don't, I don't do that. Yeah. Um, are there when you first started? Were there other writers' inspirations? I mean, there's only one book, like, and I've written yeah. that where, where um, the red car was just a total, like, I was in a stuck place and I didn't know what to write. And I thought, well, I'm going to write a Haruki Murakami book. And oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. About and that. I told yeah, yeah. yeah, you yeah. talked, that was the last time yeah. we talked. And so that book really, like, actually stole themes from his novels. Yeah. And I tried that. And so that was great. It really got me going. And I think I've talked. This has a little thing. Maybe. Maybe. The un way that yeah. unexpected. Right. I mean, the thing I also get permission from him to do, and I don't, as it, his newest books, I still enjoy them, but they weren't like what they used to be for me because I feel like he just reaches for the same stuff, which I think is sort of great. But yeah. I mean, there's a her Murakami bingo kind of game where it's like if there's a cat, have a drink. If there's whiskey, have a drink. If there's, and I feel like for a while, I'm like, well, I can do that too. I can have swimming pools. I can have sea lions. I can keep. Uh, Joan Gideon has that too. Does she? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it's laziness, or maybe it's okay. What do you think? Well, do you think it's sort of? I always think. Well, they always say that writers are always trying to write the same book. Yeah. I think there's this constellation of images that right. someone told me once that I always have scars in my books. Yeah, and you're not even aware of that, right? Yeah, yeah. not at all. I mean, yeah. now I am, so yeah. now it's just like, no one can get a scar <laughs> from trying to fight it so hard. But Maybe it is so. that part of the, you know, because we are yeah. trying to generate ideas yeah. for, yeah. you know, however long it takes to write, how long did it take to write the first draft? Probably about a, a year. Yeah, so you're sort of, yeah. your brain is like hunting for things. It's yeah. going to go to that right. familiar. Maybe. You know. I mean, maybe the familiar is good. I don't know. I sometimes have a strange feeling about writing. Maybe I'd love to hear what you have to say, too. That sometimes people think the harder you work, the better things are going to turn out. And sometimes the easier things you write, they just come out They just come out better. But because it's so easy, you don't value it. So, yes. Yeah. No, I think that is true. And forcing it, you think I have to force it. You know, just have to keep... Because there's all the maniacal stuff about, just sit in the chair and do it. Oh, but that's just, I can write, you can write 20 bad pages just like that. Stuff. Yeah. 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 So why force yourself? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things I always tell people about with your books um, is that there's just no, there's a tone you have that is like, and it's not the same through all the books either, but there's something in your tone that speaks to the kind of writer that's like no other writer I've ever read. There's something kind of, deadpan about it but also like really off kilter and like things you like sentences turn around in ways you don't expect and I think that that's the kind of stuff that could get revised away if yeah. you were careful I mean I so do, you, do you think about tone I mean no one yeah. ever thinks about their own tone I suppose because you it's if you did you would it would you would lose it but yeah 
I mean, I know that I, I can't try to be funny, that if I try to be funny, I won't be funny. But I know that like when I revise things, if I do it too much, I feel like I'm going to take just, I'm just going to lose what was there that I didn't know how I put it there, but I don't want to take it out. Yeah, it's, yeah, I have an example. I mean, I just think this is a perfect example of the way your sentences work. Um, because there are, people say awful things a lot, too, in your book, which I think you get away with. I mean, like yeah. other people say things to Alice oh, yeah. that feel really sort of cruel, but you completely believe they would say it. But also mm -hmm. there's this, think about this in relation to the men in the book and in your book. Um, she had only just realized that she loved him. That's one paragraph. But maybe it was easy to mistake food and sex for love. That's the whole paragraph. Then the next paragraph. Or maybe that was what love was, and she had the real thing. Yeah. And every time I read that, I mean, I gave you a little shush, but I feel like I can hear the voice in my head mm -hmm. where, like, turning it around and turning it around, mm -hmm. and it just sort of gets, it gets more logical and thoughtful, and then it gets, you know, like, this sort of, um, right. Do you, it makes me think that maybe you read aloud or that there's a rhythm when you write. There's definitely a rhythm when I write, but I don't read aloud. So I think I must be reading it in my head. Like, I love repetition. Because yeah. even those paragraph breaks feel yeah. almost like a poet, right? You, yeah. know, you need the break. Of They're the almost paragraph. too short. Like, I'm kind of surprised that I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but there yeah. it's sort of, she's having a sort of a, right. a, a revelation. Yeah. That is, like, like, maybe she does love him, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. you kind of think, maybe she doesn't. And because it also feels like anything could be true right now. Yeah. Because we're so much in her head and that level of immersion. Um, okay, well, I want to ask, and then we'll see if people have questions. I do want to ask what's next for you because oh, it does right. feel like the thing you're supposed to ask, even oh, though I know yeah. writers hate, yeah. hate being asked the <laughs> question. <laughs> so I'm very cool for doing it. You do not have to answer. <laughs> um, I'm working on something. I don't know. I was working on something, and I'm not sure if I'm working on it. I've had the opportunity to like turn this. Somebody said, "Do you want to turn this into a screenplay yourself?" Or, and usually, I give stuff away. It would be a great movie. Oh yeah, yeah. So, but do I want to write it myself? So I have the chance to write it myself. So I might do that. I think you should. All right. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I think because it also the it, it you know I was talking about Julie Didion, but to me that very much these '70s movies of women adrift and. Mm -hmm you know, causing trouble for themselves and others, and it feels like there's just very few movies like that with a woman at the center where yeah. all the rails are off. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, usually, like, when, when I might, I've, I've had all these interactions with Hollywood that have, haven't worked out that are all still, like, in the back burner right now, but this is the first time that somebody who wants to work with me said, hey, do you want to write it? And I was like, really? So that could be cool, but I'm not sure. But no yeah. one else could. I mean, because the tone is so specific, okay. I feel like. Right. I feel like they would get it wrong yeah. or they would make it too jokey or something. I feel like yeah. they would lean on the... It's such a strange balance of heaviness and light yeah. and darkness and oddity and all that. Oh, I, I talk too much, but yes. Okay. Let's, let's get some um, questions from the audience. I just want to go off of that so you'd become an Allison. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you have the swimming like, pool. Yeah, yeah you're swimming That's pool. That's a little too meta, isn't it? Else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and now I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But no, that's an interesting point, and it's true, so that's yeah. really interesting. Um, I have another question, okay. though. Um, so, Red Car, I'm thinking of, like, Red Car, very nice, Hurricane Girl, and so I think all of them are in, like, third person, right? None of them are in first person. I think very nice is in first person. It's in first person. Yeah. But there's so much like pettiness of these characters. Yeah. Despite so especially in Hurricane Girl, and she doesn't even have full awareness at all times. Yeah. I read it, so I'm trying not to spoil yes. it. <laughs> so she doesn't even have full awareness at all times, and yet you're so much in her head and it's like third person. I'm wondering if like you think about that kind of like point of view when you're writing your character. I love that. I mean, that's why, why that's why screenplay writing is daunting because that's what I love to do is is I like the inner mon monologue. Like, mm -hmm. it's, and I love writing a sentence and then having the next sentence completely contradict itself. I do that all the time, and I don't have a single example. But yeah, but I mean, that was I the one I just read. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. 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 thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You did yeah. a good job. <laughs> yeah. I expected her to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's that close third person. Yeah. Is, yeah. 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 You feel like it's in her head. And there's a lot of, like, imperfect women, which I love. Yeah. Because, I mean, aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Um, I recently read Bad Marie, and the version I had had, like, um, a Q&A in the right, book. Right, right, right. And it mentioned that that book was largely inspired by French cinema. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was any cinema or anything. 
I, I don't watch as many movies as I used to know with that mm -hmm. book. I think, I mean, I have watched very few horror, but the little bit of horror that I've seen, you know, that's all in there, like Scream, like going into the house. Yeah. Like suspense. <laughs> so I think, I think that's all just what it is, and it's not expensive. So I was like, yeah, definitely. Sarah? I'm just thinking about the humor thing. So mm -hmm. when you talk, I think this book is really, really funny, as are, like, most of your books, I think, in some ways, or the way the language works makes it funny. So then I was thinking about, well, how would you actually make that humor in a screenplay? I mean, it could be like an action horror, but how do you get that in there? Which I, I guess know. you got to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> so answer that question, I'm just yeah. wondering aloud. Yeah. But, but I do have a question about okay. humor. Like, yeah. when you're writing, mm -hmm. are, you, are you conscious of it being funny as you're doing, or do you just do it and then go back in? No, so like, I mean, I don't, I don't write it consciously, but sometimes I know after I've done it, I'm like, oh, that's a little bit funny. So I'm, I can't <laughs> just be funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got that some awareness. Yeah. yeah. It feels like the, the what the trick always is adapting your own first screen. Like the movie has to have that tone, right? So that's the sort of trick is to translate that to the movie's tone rather than just Allison's head. Yeah. But it feels like you could do that. Maybe I think you could. <laughs> yeah, I, about that. I I thought it, you were just talking, and I kept on thinking about Almodovar's movies. Yeah. You know, he has a little bit of that horror stuff, but then also he makes it funny. To the point where there have been movies that people are a little bit like shocked and don't know how to react to, oh, whether I should really laugh at this or should I be horrified at this. And obviously, I, I think your the tone of your book is more subtle, and that balance is what keeps us like throughout the whole um, book sort of guessing as to what's going to happen. And the other comment that I had was that I haven't thought about it till now, but I guess I felt a little bit on shaky ground throughout the whole book when I was reading it. And then at the end, I was so happy. You know, <laughs> oh, you were? Like, well, there's the feminist punch, oh, you know? Like, okay. And I really like that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, I, I don't know. I really... I, but did you think about that conscientiously of what you were doing? Or no, I realized I should be repeating the question, oh, oh, which yeah. I totally forgot to do. But the, 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 the question was about the... The feminist punch of the of the ending that you were very satisfied and, and uh, yeah, did you want to speak to that? Um, I don't know. No, I didn't know that I was doing that. I mean, I, I'd be surprised to write something that wasn't feminist. It's just sort of like um, what what I was trained to do. Um, but I just really like that she took control. Yeah, yeah, I like that she I took control like, too. Yeah. I felt like throughout the whole book she didn't have that much control. Right. I, like she was always like walking on a fine line, and then yeah. she's. She sort of takes like complete control and like. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I take credit for that. And I like. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is this like running. I guess it's a running joke. It is a joke. She yes. just Allison refuses to really remember the name of her brother's baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, that Just I, to say, like, again, yeah, so okay. for the audience on, on YouTube, the question was about the running gag about not knowing her her uh, niece or nephew. No, I can't remember the yeah, name. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I forgot <laughs> yeah. the um, name. I think I did know that was funny. <laughs> and so I kept going with it. And I think there's something, like, in my own family that's been a little bit bad about how family members, like, all of us have treated each other when we've had children. Like, the whole idea of what you see about family coming through for you and didn't didn't happen with my child it didn't happen with my brother's child and so that that was in there for sure and then phoebe is just a name that i like love so there you go i got to put a name in that i love and then you know i've recently fallen in love with phoebe bridgers so that worked out and she yeah. has a name but i did yeah i don't know so but i was aware when i was doing it i really liked when when Dan, oh there's a nice kiss that happens over the baby and she she calls it by the wrong name it was just such a like that's what i love about writing by the way i mean i remember writing that moment and i just like loved it like i don't know that's the thing about writing when you write a moment and it just fills you with pleasure and that was that was definitely one of them yeah it also um it's sort of like Everyone wants to be the baby in that family. Oh, maybe. You know, yeah. it feels like everyone, you know, and no one's taking care of anyone. Everyone wants yeah. to be the baby, and no one wants to be the caretaker of the right. baby, and yeah. of any baby, so, <laughs> so anybody. So mm -hmm. it does feel like the, you do learn a lot about the family just through that, through that, mm -hmm. and how they're dealing with the, 
you know, Allison's crisis, which right. is they're not dealing with it at all. Yeah, probably not. Other questions? Yeah, hey, Marcy, congrats on, on your book. I love Very Nice. It's one of my favorite books. I'm really Thank looking you. forward to reading this. Um, first, just a quick suggestion. Okay. There's all this talk about swimming pools. I was thinking maybe you could do an homage to John Cheever's The Swimmer, yeah. Oh, yeah. like on your 10th book, and have a character swim through all the swimming pools from your past book. Great idea. <laughs> all I want is an idea. <gasps> yeah. I, 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 that, that was mentioned in a review of Very Nice on NPR. They mentioned, they mentioned this. The yeah. swimmer. It was about John Cheever's The Swimming, swim, yeah. The Swimmer. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. And my, my, my question's kind of silly. So I'm, uh, editing my own first novel for like the 20th time and um, there's some words I hate it, and I found that they snuck their way in there like gobble. I just hate that word. I don't know why. Slather. I don't like that word. Do you have any words you hate, Marcy? Well, the great qu question is about any words that you might hate. It's a great question. I mean, almost all of them are just like I forgot adjective for adverb, but like you never want to have characters mutter all those things that you do instead of saying said. They should almost all go, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. Moist. Moist. Yeah. Don't like moist. No, I, don't I know like that's that. a big trigger for a lot of yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> I usually use the ones I hate the most over and over again. Why? Why do you do that? I know they they trouble me. Oh, oh, I'm writing thrillers, so oh, you know, yeah, we're yeah. trying to create a disturbing atmosphere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. What yeah. about words you love that you find yourself mm. using going to certain words that you love? <laughs> Wait, I'll just I'll just go into an answer okay. how that's not answering your question. Okay. I was just really happy to put Ashley Judd in my book because I just <laughs> wanted to. Yeah. I, I think I've always wanted to put her in a book before. I don't know about, about words. Like I don't think I have words that I love, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. Okay, but yeah, I just dodged it. <laughs> Really done. Thank Other you. questions? With, sorry, did you mean, um, when you write, do you listen to music? And if you do, oh. are was there any kind of music besides DB, DB Breakers? I don't even think I even listen to DB Breakers. I think I just, <laughs> I think at this point I have like on Spotify, I have something that's called like short best songs. And so it used to always just be one artist. Like it used to just be one year with Scarlett Johansson. And one year it was like Beth Orden. Yeah, Bad Marie was all to one Scarlet Johansson album. And now I think I have like about 15 songs and they're just in rotation. And I don't really, I mean, some people can't write with words, but I think I've just heard these songs to infinity, so I don't really listen to them. And so that's what I do. Yeah. But I like, I need music and headphones. I just need to like sort of block out the world. So music is part of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I love when you talk about like uh, the books that are abandoned, you know, like the graveyard of books. I feel yeah. like writers never talk about the books that go in the drawer. And I laud you for it only being 10 pages, 1,300 pages, right. <laughs> where you quit. So well, that's already quit, quit sufficient. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, oh, yeah. like what, you know, again, what is the thing that makes you realize, no, um, this can't, you know, already this can't be saved or this can't continue? versus what makes you think, yeah, this is yes, I'm going to continue with this, um, with what I'm doing now. The question is about abandoned manuscripts and what makes you decide, I uh, know I'm going to keep going with this, or what makes you think, no, I've got to abandon shit. Yeah. It's hard. Like, I mean, I think I might have just recently abandoned a novel that I probably shouldn't have. And the funny thing is, is that then you can go back to it. Like, I did at one point abandon Bad Marie. And, and then like six months later, I wasn't writing anything. I was like, oh, that was pretty good. And so that, that's a good option. But there's, there's some waste of time in writing, for sure. So. It feels too like, like there's a certain catch fire feeling yeah, that you have. And if you don't have it, like sometimes you just don't have it for a few days or a few weeks. But if it's that, like sometimes I think it goes away. I've had ones like a couple hundred pages. Yeah. And just like if you, if you dread sitting in front of it every day, that's probably not the book for you. <laughs> yeah. I think with yeah. this book, I kind of pretended that I wasn't really writing a novel. Like I never even acknowledged it as a novel that I was writing until it was like done. I'm like, oh, I guess this is my next novel. <laughs> but yeah. So there was that. This one, this one had, I usually have very few readers while I'm working on it. Like I have one reader or two readers. This one really only just had one reader. And, and she's just my friend who tells me everything I write is good. It's right <laughs> <laughs> a good friend. She's great, yeah, she's really good. Any other questions? Well, thank you thank so you. much, Marcy. Thanks, Megan. Um, thank you.
thank you so much, everyone. And thank you again, Marcy and Megan, for such a fun conversation. Um, as a reminder, Marcy and Megan will be signing at our back desk. Um, so please just wait to approach the desk until they've both gotten settled back there. You can purchase additional copies of Hurricane Girl at the signing desk. And for those who are still with us on YouTube, you can find the link to purchase books in the description as well. Um, that is all for me. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Please join me in giving Marcy and Megan a final round of applause. <laughs>